On this uh, Science Wednesday, let's head out to the Payload Operations Integration Center at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama now. Lori Meggs is there, and Lori, we're talking about nutrition and well-being for astronauts today, as well as for here on Earth. Kelly, the number one priority for NASA is to keep our space station astronauts safe and healthy. To do that, we have to understand what really happens to our bodies in microgravity. Now, there are two things, two experiments that have looked at this. One right now is the Pro-K experiment. It looks at the nutritional intake of astronauts. It's ongoing, and the nutrition experiment which wrapped up earlier this year. Dr. Scott Smith, he is the lead for the nutrition and biochemistry lab at Johnson Space Center, and he tells us what we've learned from these experiments and where we're going. I've always been very happy to say that we were the first blood collection on board the International Space Station. Um, we'd collected blood on shuttle, we'd collected blood on Skylab, but it took several years until we had enough, until we had the right hardware on board station to allow us to collect blood during flight on station. Anything um, you can share with us so far? We found, we've found several things. Um, the, the biggest thing I think we found is that um, we found metabolites in the blood that are reflective of a, of a specific biochemical pathway, what we call the one carbon metabolism pathway, um, that are different in individuals that had vision issues during spaceflight. Okay? And the, the one carbon metabolism pathway is a very nutrition rich pathway. It's got several vitamins tied into it, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, folate, biotin, a number of things that are involved, which is why we were looking at it. It wasn't until we started teasing out crew members that had vision issues and crew members that didn't have vision issues that allowed us to, to see that there, was a, there appeared to be a relationship. The striking thing was not only that we had differences in blood levels of, of these metabolites in individuals with vision issues, the, the bigger thing, I think, is that we had differences pre-flight. And after we ruled out a number of other things and, and looked at the data as many ways as we could, we, we focused in on the possibility that um, genetic differences could be causing this biochemical difference, which could be related to these changes in vision. And we're now doing a follow-on study, which isn't really a flight study, although we're doing it with the astronauts. Um, where we're actually going back in and looking at their genes for specific enzymes in this pathway to see if we can then relate the, the actual genetic information to, um, to vision issues. And how could this help us here on Earth? Well, the, it could be a lot of things. I mean, it, we could still, you know, I, I would say as a caveat, you know, we're very excited about these data. We think we're going down the right path. We could be wrong. So th this could be a fluke. When we look at the scientific literature and the medical literature about this, this pathway, People with alterations in this pathway also tend to have increased risk of stroke, increased risk of migraines, um, increased risk of, of other types of vascular diseases. Um, and it's possible that, again, if, if our data help flesh this out, um, that this may also have implications for um, understanding of health and physiology in, in everyday humans. And then the second experiment is what we call Pro-K, which is getting at the the relationship of dietary protein, which is the pro, and dietary potassium, which is the K. Um, and what we believe in that experiment is that the ratio of animal protein and potassium in your diet may have an effect on your bone health. That is, the more, the more animal protein you consume, the more red meat you consume, and the less fruits and vegetables you consume, which are rich in potassium, the, more, the higher that ratio, the more bone breakdown you see. So uh, the converse is, yes, that we believe that by modifying the diet, by increasing fruits and vegetables, decreasing red meat, and perhaps increasing fish intake or, or uh, vegetable protein intake, that that may be one, made, one way to help mitigate the bone loss that we see in astronauts. And joining me now is someone who knows about nutrition and our diets and how that affects everyday life is Linda Stakely. She is a nutritionist and registered dietitian at the Huntsville Hospital Wellness Center. Linda, thanks for joining you us today. Welcome. You heard Dr. Smith and what he had yes. to say. Tell us your thoughts on how that translates to us here on Earth. Well, when I think about an astronaut's diet, 
and people that are up at the uh, payload station, I'm thinking of more of a perfect diet because it's been formulated, they've had biochemists work on it, they've had dietitians work on it, scientists, so it's more of a perfect diet. But here on Earth, our diets are not so perfect. And the one of the studies that he looked at was the pro-K, and they're decreasing the, the protein but increasing the potassium in the diet. And that has to do with bone density. And so I brought along a plate with me today just to show how we could how we can compute that into real life. It looks pretty so, good actually. It, it does. <laughs> if you would take your plate and divide it into four quadrants, what we'd like to see people to do is have a fourth of your plate as your protein. And this is a three ounce portion of chicken. And that's really about all we need. And then a quarter of your plate would be your starch. And this just happens to be brown rice. But I like to see half of your plate as fruits and vegetables. And I like to see the more colorful vegetables that have the antioxidants in it. But the thing about this is you're getting more potassium when you're eating fruits and vegetables. And so you get an added benefit when you have extra potassium in your diet to lower your blood pressure. So not only does it help bone density, but it helps to lower your blood pressure. So how much protein, uh, potassium, I'm sorry, do we need? We need probably about 3,500 milliequivalents of potassium a day, and uh, we easily get that if we include fruits and vegetables in our diet. But the problem is we are a meat and potato society, so it's more it's half our plate's meat and half of our plate is potatoes. So we need to include more fruits and vegetables in the diet to get that potassium that we need. And probably if you're eating 45 to 55 grams of protein for a female, you're getting enough for a male, probably no more than about 65 grams unless you're really a, a weight in weight training and then you might need as much as 100, 110 or 20 grams of protein but most people don't need that much but that's what we end up getting. We talk about the perfect diets of, of those in space but, but they're sometimes in a stressful situation. Tell us how stress relates to right. what we eat and, and how that affects well, us. Well, when we're stressed here on Earth, we don't eat right. We don't choose right. And, and when we feel those stress hormones, we tend to want something salty, something sweet, something fatty, and so we make bad choices. We don't go and eat a good vegetable lunch or dinner. So the stress can cause you to drink more coffee, which is going to increase the stress. It can cause you to, to drink more alcohol, to skip meals, and to over eat when you do eat at mealtime. So a stressful diet is obviously going to affect your immune system. It's going to affect how you feel, how you perform. So eating more healthy foods and more like Dr. Smith is talking about, less protein, more fruits and vegetables, is going to be the healthy approach. But that's not what we turn to when we're stressed. We yeah, turn to something sweet. In fact, I asked you earlier, what is, is stressed spelled backwards? It's dessert. It is dessert. <laughs> and that's what people tend to go to. Something sweet, you know, especially women. You know, we oftentimes want that piece of cake or we want that cookie or that, that sweet after a meal. And many times it's just because we're feeling so stressed and uptight. And it's that carbohydrate which releases serotonin. It's that feel good hormone. And it kind of helps us get through it briefly. He talked a little bit about the, the B vitamin, yes. too. Uh, tell us uh, what are some sources of B vitamins? Well, your B vitamins mainly come from your breads and cereals. But the problem with that is so many of our breads and cereals are highly processed. What you want to look for on your label is 100% whole wheat or 100% whole grain product. So if your label does not say whole grain or whole wheat, then it is a highly processed food. White bread, uh, the Iron Kids bread, the white wheat bread, honey wheat bread, all of that is very processed. And what you really want is 100% whole wheat or whole grain because the nutrients have not been removed and they're there for us and they're better utilized by the body than what they just throw in there. We also talked about bone health. That's that's yes. a big deal on Space Station. What what other factors influence bone well, health? Well, there are a lot of factors here on Earth that influence bone health. If you are doing load-bearing exercise, that is going to be a, a really important thing to, to help you to strengthen your bones. But also calcium is important, and calcium that has, uh, calcium that you also have vitamin D at the same time helps to make those bones stronger. So. Calcium in the diet, load-bearing exercise, those are important things. And again, too much protein in the diet is not going to be healthy for the bones, here on Earth as well as in space. How much protein should we have there? 
about 45 to 55 for women and probably 65 to 75 for men. Don't need any more than that. You know, three ounces of meat at lunch and three ounces at dinner is really going to get us what we need. I don't know but, if that's enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens when we go out to eat, we get five to six ounces at lunch and maybe even more at dinner. Uh, and when we eat so much meat, we don't eat those vegetables. And that's the problem. All right. And I know it probably excites you to hear about, what do you think when you hear about nutritional studies in space? Oh, it's wonderful. It's so exciting that they're doing all of this and then we take that information and we can apply it here on Earth. Uh, and I love the fact that the diets that they uh, prepare for the astronauts are so carefully planned to give them everything that they need. And if it were just so here on Earth and so simple, but we have a variety of choices and we oftentimes make the wrong choices. So maybe all this good information to show how well our astronauts do in space will help people to realize if they just ate better, uh, they would be a lot healthier. So much good information. Thank you, Linda, You're so much so for being with us today. Linda Stakely from Huntsville Hospital Wellness Center. Now let's take a live look into the Payload Operations Integration Center. They've just wrapped up working on the in-space experiment this morning. They're putting some things away for that and um, planning for a new crew. So that'll do it for us here from the Payload Operations Integration Center at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston.